so we're going to move to our first panel uh, on tobacco. Uh, and I'm going to ask Michael Herring, uh, Joelle Lester, and Mark Greenwald to come to the front here, the three seats um, for target practice. Uh, and um, the bios of each of the speakers are, are in the conference, uh, uh, are on the, in the flyer that's outside. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat what's in the bio, but we're very lucky to have uh, Michael here, who is the Director and Chief Counsel of the National Association of Attorneys General Center for Tobacco and Public Health. Joelle Lester is the Director of Tobacco Control Public Health Law Center at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, and Mark Greenwald is now a senior consultant in the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. We're going to follow uh, a, uh, a, 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 an agenda for each of our panels that has an overview by one of the individuals and then two commentators. We'll uh, chip in some thoughts and we'll have time for questions. Uh, Mark, or rather Michael, thank you. Thank you. All right, that works better. I, uh, I am Michael Herring here from uh, NAG, the National Association of Attorneys General, and I have approximately 10 to 12 minutes, I'm told, to summarize the MSA. So I am going to move rather quickly. Um, well, um, the first slide here is just to remind you where things were. Um, I'm looking around the room. Uh, most of you look uh, as if you are of an age that you can remember the, the uh, the 80s and 90s and, and what it was like prior to the MSA. Uh, that, that first picture there of the doctor goes even further back and the, and the Flintstones hawking, uh, I think those are Winston's, if I remember correctly, are, um, are even earlier. But, but many of you probably remember when the tobacco executive stood up before Congress and swore that nicotine was not uh, addictive and smoking did not cause cancer. So I, I, I'm just here to tell you that we've, we've come a long way from those days. Um, this is a headline uh, from the New York Times at the, uh, at the beginning when we first signed the MSA back in 1998. Uh, the MSA was executed in 1998. It resolved the claims uh, between the states and the major tobacco companies. Um, they agreed to make payments uh, to the states in, in perpetuity. However, there are certain misleading uh, items in this article. Number one, it's, it's not really $206 billion. That was the present value estimate of the first 25 years. In fact, if you go to our website, the NAG website, you'll see we have a chart of the payments to the states to date, and it's more like 126. We're not going to hit 206 in the first 25 years. The other thing is that the idea that this is only 25 years. In fact, the companies make payments to the states in perpetuity. So long as cigarettes are sold by participating manufacturers in the United States, um, that is the, the, the companies that have signed the agreement and settled with the states, so long as those um, cigarettes are sold, Marlboros, Camels, Newports, et cetera, there will be payments made to the states on an annual basis. And those um, payments, um, are upcoming. They're coming on tax day, April 15th of the year, and, and they are currently running uh, just a little bit about, uh, below $7 billion a year. $7 billion a year, $7 billion a year that is spread out amongst the states. Um, the payments are roughly based on per carton sales. I imagine that everyone knows what a pack of cigarettes is and a carton, 10 packs, 200 cigarettes. Right now, they run at about um, a little bit above $7 per carton, and, and one of the, the most, uh, the best features of our agreement is that there is an inflation adjustment on our payments on an annual basis of 3% or the consumer price index, whichever is higher. So those uh, originally were in the order of about $3 a carton, then four, five, six, seven, and so on, and we're, we're headed up. Uh, Soon will be north of the federal excise tax on, on a carton of cigarettes, which is about ten dollars in, in just a few years. Um, the the roots of the sell, the settlement, I, and I didn't mention this yet. The roots of the settlement go back to a case originally brought by uh, then Attorney General Mike Moore from Mississippi. He first sued the tobacco companies in 1994. Um, uh, for a variety of claims, and then he went around to his colleagues in the various AG's offices to um, encourage them to join him. And in, at that time, I was a young lawyer in the Massachusetts Attorney General's office, and I'd done a few 
items on, on tobacco, regarding tobacco. Uh, he called me up to his office to hear Mike Moore make the pitch to us. Massachusetts then became the, the fifth state to file against the tobacco companies, um, and, and the rest is history, at least from, from my perspective. Um, the, um, uh, the settling states in, under the MSA are all of the 50 U.S. states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, plus four territories. However, there are four states that are not part of the settlement. Those are uh, Florida, Texas, Minnesota, and Mississippi. Um, so we have um, in, the, in the Master Settlement Agreement 46 states proper, again, District of Columbia, and five territories, Puerto Rico, um, Guam, American Samoa, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and the Virgin Islands. In our agreement, we call them states. For simplicity's sake, we haven't elevated them under the Constitution, as you know. Uh, but when I refer to the states, I'm referring to the territories as well. The other four states, the four states in blue here, um, they, it's not that they haven't settled with the companies, they did, but they settled prior to the Master Settlement Agreement. Essentially what we had was, again, Michael Moore in Mississippi started this. Minnesota was the first state to get to trial. Uh, and um, because they got to trial, um, they, they settled on the eve uh, after trial but before judgment. Um, and, and then uh, Florida, then Texas. And at that point, the company said, wait a minute, we don't want to do the seriatim. We, we would like to settle with the rest of you all in, in one big settlement. And that is, in fact, what happened. And even states that had not at that time brought an action against the tobacco companies, you can imagine Virginia, North Carolina, home of the two biggest tobacco companies at the time, I don't believe had brought an action against the tobacco companies at that time. They nonetheless were part of our settlement and uh, sign the MSA and participate in it. And, and we're encouraged by the tobacco companies to do so because, of course, the companies wanted finality. They wanted to put an end to this uh, uh, for, for, all, um, uh, for all sake. The states um, each receive what's known as an allocable share of the payment. I mentioned earlier that the payment is running about $6.8 billion a year. That is um, what we think of as a unitary payment. There is no payment, say, to New York to Washington, D.C., to New Jersey, et cetera. Rather, there is a, a one single payment that Philip Morris makes. Philip Morris would be $4 billion and change. Uh, and then each state receives what's known as its allocable share of that amount. The allocable share is um, runs from 12% uh, for the larger states down to about 2% uh, for some of the medium-sized states. Uh, New York and California, 12%, for example. Say Virginia would be a 2%. And then um, there are some states that receive uh, less than one or a fraction, uh, and the territories are much smaller. Um, the, oops, somehow I went ahead of, I'm missing a slide. No, there we go. I think those are out of order. Um, the basics of the agreement. Um, what we're talking about here is a, a settlement, again, between the, the MSA settling states and the tobacco companies. Um, there are essentially, um, and I, I, I forgot to mention the, the, the participating manufacturers in the prior slide. I, I should mention that what we have uh, are um, the largest tobacco companies. I think I had Philip Morris and RJR up there. Uh, uh, RJR has since swallowed up the two uh, largest, other largest at the time of the settlement, which were Brandon Williamson and Lorillard. Uh, they've merged into RJR. We also have some 20 to 30 uh, other small manufacturers. What, what, what I suppose is most salient to know is that at the time of the settlement and, and, and briefly thereafter, we had about 99.6% of the U.S. market in the, in the settlement, a lot of tobacco companies that you've probably never heard of. Again, um, the basics of the agreement are essentially that the, uh, the states received three things roughly. Um, they received the marketing and advertising restrictions contained within the MSA. They received, of course, the payments that I mentioned earlier. And they also received um, uh, money that went to start a anti-tobacco organization known as the, the Truth Initiative. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Hilton, who was the uh, original director of, of the the Truth Initiative may, may uh, speak to that in, uh, later on. Um, so we got received those basic three things. The participating manufacturers, on the other hand, um, received 
releases uh, for, the, for the claims that were brought against them, the claims that could be brought against them, uh, uh, e et cetera. But what's important to note here is that are only claims brought by the states. There was no settlement on behalf of the citizens. Individual citizens can and still do bring tort actions against the tobacco companies. Their claims were not settled. Uh, and this goes a bit to um, what uh, Ken Feinberg was talking about. For instance, when I was back in Massachusetts, at the time of the original settlement, we had citizens calling our office saying, essentially, hi, I smoked, my mother smoked, she died from cancer, where's my check? Um, you know, something along those lines. And I had the unfortunate task of explaining to them that I'm sorry, we didn't, we didn't bring this as a kind of class action on behalf of all the citizens of Massachusetts. Rather, we brought this on behalf of the state to compensate it for the health care costs, the Medicaid expenditures uh, that the state had to make um, uh, because of the, um, uh, the health consequences, the disease and death caused by the citizens smoking. And, and therefore, the money goes to the states. You, mm -hmm. the individual citizens, uh, do not get the money directly. Of course, we hope that you'll benefit indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, but if you wish to bring an action, it's still open to you because we have not settled your claims. Um, all right. I, um, what, what has happened in, 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 since the MSA? We, we believe that this is a, a, a real public health success that um, this slide gives you an idea. It's the percentage of high school students who currently smoke. Um, and you, know, we, you, you can look at the, the red line is prior to the MSI, MSA. The blue is what you've seen um, uh, since then. So we, we've had um, a real success over the, the first 20 years of the MSA. We're talking from 36.4% of high schoolers who are currently smoke down, down to 8.8%, a decline of over 75%. Um, here is a, another way of looking at it, which is general consumption. Again, the red is prior to the MSA. Um, the blue is post-MSA in terms of uh, general consumption. We're talking about a 45% decline from 98 to 2017. And there are a number of reasons for that decline. There are essentially four ways that the MSA, there are more than four, but the four essential ways that the MSA promotes uh, declines in, in smoking and in consumption are the following. First of all, the MSA restricts the marketing and advertising of the tobacco companies, which I can mention later. It also increases the price of the cigarettes. That $7 a carton and, and going up each year increases the price of cigarettes. People um, are, uh, there is a, a price elasticity, elasticity of demand for cigarettes of roughly 3% higher for youth. So for every 10% increase in cigarette price, there's a 3% decline in consumption higher for youth. And so simply by increasing the price of the product, we're seeing a decline in uh, consumption and the uptake of, of, of cigarette smoking. We also, of course, mentioned the, the money that went to the Truth Initiative, um, uh, one point, uh, over $1.6 billion uh, to, to fund anti-smoking anti um, uh, initiatives. And then there's the money that goes to the states, which could, if used for that purpose, um, go to good works in terms of reducing smoking, public health benefits. It's not always done, so I'm sure you'll hear more about that. Um, this slide is simply uh, to give you an idea of, of the, the payments to the, the, the states and, and what's been going on with those. The point here is that the green line is what the payments have been or, or should have been to the states. The purple line is what they actually, the money actually going to the states. And, and what you can see is it, it goes, the green line goes up. That's because of an increase in what we call the base amount and also inflation. It went down a couple of years uh, there because of a huge, um, the feds not quite tripled, but more than doubled the federal excise tax on, tax on cigarettes. And we saw a 9% decline in consumption in a single year. Less cigarettes bought means less money to the states. We view that as a good deal uh, because it's, it's less uh, health claims down the road, the latent um, uh, problems that uh, Ken Feinberg spoke about. Uh, all the same, it does mean less money. But what you see is this other line that looks like an EKG, and it's going up and down and so on. And what that is is disputes over the payments. We have had, from the beginning, disputes with the tobacco companies over the payments. Our largest dispute is something known as the NPM adjustment. I won't go into it, but... But let, let me tell you that um, they, at their option, when they have a legitimate dispute, 
can, sometimes even an illegitimate dispute, but most of the time they, they have a, um, a, a legitimate dispute, they will put money either into what's known as the disputed payments account, an escrow account held at Citibank, or they'll simply withhold it, they'll keep it themselves. And, and then we have to resolve those disputes. And so what you see is the money going into the disputed payments account uh, or being withheld, and then you see resolutions of those disputes, either through arbitration or court process or settlements. Mm -hmm. Um, I will tell you that at one time we had over, I think, close to $9 billion in, in escrow uh, in dispute. We now have about $3 billion. Um, okay, the marketing and advertising restrictions. Let's talk a little bit about those. These are um, Section 3 of the MSA, um, and we have a number of them. We have a prohibition on targeting youth. You see there a cool mix campaign that, that Brown and Williamson was doing at one time that we felt um, targeted youth. Um, we prohibit the use of cartoons. Many of you probably remember Joe Camel. Um, at one time, better known to kindergartners around the United States than the logo, the Mickey Mouse ears logo of the Disney Channel. Um, Joe Camel's gone. Other tobacco cartoon characters are gone. There's a limitation on brand name sponsorship. That's a Marlboro racing car, an F1 car. Um, you will see, you have seen a lot less of those. Uh, the billboards, elimination of outdoor and transit advertising, billboards, one way, the feds long ago, uh, back in 68, banned tobacco advertising on, on television. How did the tobacco companies get around that? Put up a billboard at Shea Stadium when, the, when there's a, a fly ball to the outfield, what do you see? A big Marlboro across the television screen. Those are gone. Uh, and then there's a limitation on the third, uh, third party use of brand names. Um, that's a, a sign outside a store. They're limited to 14 square feet. Um, they can't be any larger than that. Um, we also have uh, a prohibition on payments related to, to media, product placement. Um, th that's, a, that's the Superman with Christopher Reeves. Everybody remember that, where he pops out of a, a large billboard uh, that says Marlboro on it as Superman. That was not an accident, I will tell you. Philip yeah. Morris paid handsomely to have that as a Marlboro uh, billboard. And that was a, a, a movie uh, that, that um, well, I, I think I was uh, under, under the age at the time I originally saw it, and, and, and I'm sure many people were. It was, I think, a PG movie, if not G. Um, the, um, the, that letter to the right, I know you can't read it, but that's a, a contract between Sylvester Stallone and Brown and Williamson for, uh, uh, for him to smoke their product in, in five movies for a fee. That's all banned. No more product placement. You should not be seeing uh, their cigarettes. And, and if you see a cigarette, I'm always, of course, when I see a cigarette in the movie, looking to see whether I can see the brand name. They actually have some made-up brands that they use just for uh, uh, movies now. Uh, most of the time, they don't show it. There's also no brand name merchandise. Uh, no t-shirts, ball caps, belt buckles, jackets, bags that say emblazoned with camel, Marlboro, et cetera. There was a time when these were ubiquitous. They were giveaways, et cetera. Now you can only find them on eBay. I, I look from a, on occasion to, to see what's there. Uh, we had a recent case, um, uh, interestingly enough, where a tobacco company decided to offer compensation to, for people to get tattoos of the brand on their body. Now, mind you, these were not temporary. These are real tattoos. And depending on how prominent it was, how large it was, you could, you could win, quote, win money. Um, uh, that happened to be a very small participating manufacturer. We went after them. We stopped that practice. Um, there's a ban on uh, youth access to free samples. And then there's a, uh, a ban on uh, material misrepresentation of fact. You, you will recall, of course, the heart of this at the beginning, I showed you them standing up in Congress and saying, hey, um, these are not addictive, this, is, this does not cause cancer, a ban on that. And uh, this is an ad that we sued over because we felt that it, um, it, it went too far. It was a product where RJR talked about it, um, a cigarette may uh, present less risk of cancer. Uh, this product that they had come up with. We, we mm -hmm. argued successfully, mind you, that people, when they heard the May, they essentially said, yes, that means it does present a less risk of cancer. They read out the May uh, and, and viewed it that way. We, we believe that was misleading because they did not have the science to back that up, and we won that action. Michael, can we wrap up? I, that was my last slide, <laughs> okay. and I am done. Okay. So thank you. All right. Joelle, first comment? Uh, well, 
I wanted to talk just a little bit about how this um, settlement fit in with other litigation against the tobacco industry and then specifically how the document disclosures piece of the settlement has been important um, both in the litigation context and also in federal regulation and public health policy work around the country. So between 1950 about and 1994, when Mike Moore um, filed the litigation action, there were over 800 cases filed by individuals against the tobacco companies um, for harm, the, the illness and suffering and death caused by the use of the tobacco products. And the vast majority of the first few decades of cases were unsuccessful. Um, individuals and uh, small shop plaintiffs' attorneys had a very hard time competing in court with the resources and the vigorous scorched earth defense that the tobacco industry took, and so they would just um, lose their claims. And when the, when the AGs got involved, and then later when the U.S. Department of Justice got involved, that, that pre presented an opportunity to more fully and fairly litigate between um, similarly resourced sides. And um, so the, the litigation that led to the master settlement agreement um, pushed out really important documents. And a huge part of the settlement has been uh, the disclosure of all these documents and then the uh, storage of them and, and archiving of them at the uh, University of California at San Francisco. And they're available online. I, I recommend taking a look. It's really interesting. There's a ton of information in there. When I first started working in this field, I actually Googled my dad in there because, or not Googled, I searched for him because he worked at a stadium where they had tobacco advertising. He did not say very public health friendly things about the advertising at the time. So I give him a bad time about that. But those documents are completely available to the public. And th they've been so important for individual plaintiffs who have subsequently litigated their claims for the harms caused by the tobacco products that they used. Um, and then also convincing policymakers, including and especially Congress, um, that the industry um, knew what it said it wasn't true. Um, they had a lot of information about the science and they spent a lot of time and money distorting um, the science. That seems very relevant to some of the other um, areas of law being discussed today, especially environmental. But the, uh, you know, getting the truth out through these industry um, documents has been um, incredibly important. And that, that, that also was supported by the DOJ case, which was U.S. v. Philip Morris, um, which came after the master settlement agreement um, and, and sort of further established the facts around the, what the industry knew and when they knew it. Um, but the, uh, another way, in addition to sort of changing laws, and that, that the Congress finally passed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act in 2009, it took a really long time for them to get around to taking action and giving um, authority to the FDA to regulate tobacco products, um, and that's in no small part from the information that came um, out through the MSA and the, the DOJ case. Um, and then also at the state level, it helped sort of convince policymakers that some regulation of the use and the sale of tobacco products was required to protect health. And the, the Documents Archive has really been sort of the gift that keeps on giving. It's just a treasure trove of interesting and terrible things that the industry knew and said, um, uh, at, while well, at the same time swearing to Congress that they didn't believe um, cigarettes were addictive, for example. And um, I just want to give a very contemporary example of how it's been helpful um, is around um, showing the industry's predatory targeting of certain communities with marketing and with specific kinds of products. So um, you may be aware that menthol cigarettes are largely um, consumed by African Americans in particular. There are other groups that disproportionately use uh, menthol cigarettes, including the LGBTQ community, um, women, and young people. Um, but by far, um, it's very disproportionate in the black community. And there, it's been very difficult to get Congress or anyone else to take action in the FDA to restrict menthol cigarettes and menthol tobacco products um, beyond cigarettes. Well, one of the original tobacco industry document archive researchers is a woman named Dr. Valerie Yerger at UCSF. And she was spending all of her time going through all of these documents and she saw a lot of information, among other people, she wasn't the only one, but she saw a lot of information about how the industry saw African Americans, the things that they said about African Americans, how intentional um, the co-opting of the culture was. Um, 
and um, the disregard for the health consequences to that community. And that has been really important even this year in helping um, build support for local and state restrictions on the sale of menthol cigarettes and other tobacco products because it gives people a really different understanding and it counters the industry's arguments that this is an issue of freedom to consume the product of your choosing and shows rather that this um, particular product that has devastating health consequences was very intentionally and carefully marketed to this particular community. And so they've had success in a lot of communities in California and Minnesota in particular in restricting or prohibiting the sale of menthol cigarettes. And we're hoping that that um, success continues and moves to the state and federal level. Um, a couple of other things I just wanted to mention. Um, the um, the other there were a couple of other parts of the um, master settlement agreement that helped in getting the truth out. So the document disclosures were really important, but also the agreement required the elimination of some of the industry sort of think tanks. So the Tobacco Institute, those were. Um, the, they, those were sort of fronts to promote a different view of the science, and it, they were also um, the big tobacco companies working together sort of um, in partnership to, to carry that out. And so the master settlement, getting rid of those um, was, really, was really important. There's some limitations to this agreement that um, they're hard for this industry, but that would probably be true in other industries as well, um, in that the, it doesn't cover some of the new challenges. So um, the marketing restrictions are incredibly important, especially because it's very hard to restrict advertising and marketing because of the First Amendment if you're trying to do it through statute. But um, marketing has evolved quite a bit. So social media marketing is its own challenge. It's um, very well used by um, tobacco companies, especially um, e-cigarette companies, which sort of leads to the other challenge, which is the constant evolution and innovation in the tobacco product market. And e-cigarettes have become a really popular product, and especially Juul. And so those are products that are not um, connected to the master settlement agreement. They have huge youth appeal. There's a lot of similar concerns. Um, there's um, a lot of worry and mis you know about the longer-term consequences of um, youth use of these products and the tra transition of starting with those products and moving to combusted tobacco products. Um, but the, it's beyond the scope of the master settlement agreement. So none of the marketing restrictions, for example, or anything like that applies. So I think I'll just mention one more thing, and then I'll hand it over to Mark. But um, Michael was talking about the, the limitation of the, the payments are huge, but they are only a small part of the damages caused by tobacco product use in the United States. And so the, the individuals don't have a claim to that money. And the, that's a misunderstanding that continues to this day. Um, so I think the summer before last, there was a financial scammer who had put out all these ads saying, uh, nationally, it seemed, um, saying that if you had smoked tobacco products or used tobacco products, you were entitled to a cut of the money that had gone to your state. Call my, this number and buy my book and I'll tell you how to do it. And if you Google Master Settlement Agreement, it turns out you get my organization because we have a publication explaining what it is. And so they all called us. We got hundreds and hundreds of calls from people who told us their very compelling stories of illness and injury or the death of a parent as a result of tobacco product use. You know, and there's the their only recourse is filing a lawsuit themselves, which is that's a pretty big task for someone to undertake. Um, so it's not it's it's an option that they have, but it's not a, a low bar to clear. So it was a really um, sort of um, emotional and um, illuminating process for us to see, just get the very real human impact that continues even now as a result of tobacco product um, use in our country. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you. When Mike Moore first sued the tobacco companies in 1994, no one gave him much of a chance uh, of success. Uh, and his goals uh, were not uh, the typical goals uh, of a lawsuit. Uh, they were really broad social goals. He recognized that what he was dealing with was an attempt to address the largest preventable cause of 
death in the United States, 480,000 people a year dying from uh, tobacco use. Uh, the, the, the litigation and ultimately the settlement of the litigation uh, is really a, a legislative matter designed to deal in a forward-looking way with an ongoing problem not really to compensate, certainly not to compensate individuals, not really to compensate the state, certainly not fully, for the damages that they suffered. The AGs recognized that uh, what we had was a, a youth epidemic, that the battleground, the principal battleground, uh, was kids, because nobody starts to smoke uh, after they're 18 years of age. Uh, hardly anybody, about 90% of people who smoke uh, have started by the time they finish high school. So the, the real battleground was kids. Uh, and the goal was sharply to reduce youth smoking and addiction. And as we'll see, the master settlement has been very effective uh, in dealing with uh, some aspects, and that's one of the great successes of the master settlement agreement of the reduction in youth smoking and addiction. Uh, secondly, a, a goal was to denormalize tobacco use. Tobacco was, uh, was uh, very widely used. It was everywhere in our society. By exposing the misconduct of the industry, uh, many measures were uh, were facilitated uh, after the agreement. The agreement, it, it was, it was understood that the litigation and what, however it would end would not be uh, the end of the process, but really the beginning of the process. And discrediting the tobacco industry, demonstrating that they lied to the American public about the addictiveness and deadliness of their products led the way for sharp increases in taxes on cigarettes at the state level, at the federal level, uh, indoor clean air act, and we're now seeing uh, movement in the states uh, and uh, many uh, municipalities to establish uh, uh, a minimum age of 21 for the purchase of tobacco products. All these things uh, really flow from uh, the efforts of the AGs uh, in uh, beginning this process. Uh, in addition, they were able, using the litigation process and the settlement process, to address and prevent practices that might not have been possible to restrict by legislation. With the expansion of protection accorded to commercial speech, uh, it's very difficult, for example, uh, to imagine legislation that would say the companies could not target youth in the uh, advertising, marketing, and promotion of cigarettes. That's in the MSA. That couldn't have been legislation. There are quite a number of provisions, and as we're seeing, uh, uh, continuing expansion of protection of commercial speech, it becomes more and more important to find uh, means that this can be addressed uh, without legislation. Uh, in addition, of course, there was monetary compensation uh, from the companies for a portion, only a very small portion, of tobacco-related disease borne by the states. And finally, another goal was to finance state tobacco control programs. Those last two goals have not been uh, as successfully uh, addressed. Uh, from the point of view uh, of the uh, tobacco companies, they wanted to avoid multi-billion dollar judgments that would put them in bankruptcy. They wanted to continue to sell their product. They wanted to establish a payment stream that could be supported by increased sales prices. And there was, uh, a, I, I, sh I should say, I really don't have time to go into this, but there was a prior tobacco resolution uh, reached uh, a year before the master settlement agreement that was much more ambitious um, and uh, had the states realized what they had in hand uh, at that time uh, and been able to get the federal legislation that was necessary to implement it, we would have been in better shape. Um, that, that specifically required the companies to pass through the uh, payment 
in, in the form of increased sales prices. And why? Because the best tobacco control measure is raising the price of cigarettes. Uh, the companies were okay with that uh, as long as they could preserve their market share by imposing obligations on non-settling companies. Uh, and this is one of the great shortcomings of the master settlement agreement that the states, uh, in order to get the agreement, uh, uh, entered into an agreement with the, the major tobacco companies to become the enforcers of provisions that would preserve their market share. Now this, this is a, a chart that, uh, that demonstrates uh, quite clearly the relationship between cigarette prices and uh, 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 adult smoking uh, preference. This is, uh, this is what's happened uh, under the, the Master Settlement Agreement. This is very similar to uh, a chart that Michael showed. Uh, these uh, come from a, a, a different, uh, different survey, but you see uh, youth smoking down to less than 8%. Uh, one of the, the major problems, though, is that the states haven't devoted the resources to tobacco control measures that they were expected to. The master Solomon Agreement did not require the states to spend uh, any money uh, on tobacco control, and in fact, some of them have spent literally zero. None of them have spent as much as the CDC says is an appropriate uh, amount. As you see, Almost half a trillion dollars has been raised in the last 20 years from tobacco settlements and state tobacco taxes, but less than 3% of that revenue has been spent on tobacco prevention programs. Even in 2019, that continues to be the case, uh, and tobacco control programs uh, are effective and not expensive. CDC has told the states exactly uh, what has been demonstrated uh, over time to work very well. And $3.3 billion could do a wonderful job at performing that, but the states are spending less than half a billion dollars on that, and half of that is spent by one state, California. And it's, it's not just uh, states you would consider backward that, uh, that fail to do this. Connecticut spends zero on tobacco control. So that aspect has not been successful. So, so summarizing the results of the MSA, there was a substantial stimulus to denormalize the use of tobacco, sharp declines in smoking, especially among youth, Payments to the states were not used for tobacco control, and payments have been substantially less than expected because of the provisions of the MSA that allowed the companies to reduce their payments if they lost market share. The states were enlisted to protect the market share of the major tobacco companies in order to, in, to avoid the loss of payments. Uh, I think uh, uh, a demeaning thing uh, for the states and a function they could not perform very well because the mechanisms for doing that were inadequate under the agreement. So what are the lessons we learned from the MSA? This is my last slide. That unless a payment stream is restricted for the purposes it was intended, it will not be spent for those purposes. State legislatures have their own priorities. The attorneys general really have very little influence over what those priorities are. And if you don't use mechanisms to 
funnel the payments for what you want them to be used for, they'll be used for other purposes. Uh, the payment stream is also threatened by potential securitization. That was something that was completely unforeseen at the time of the master settlement agreement. That states needing money now would take a quick fix of a very small percentage of their, the value of their stream of payments and poof, that stream of payments is gone. Instead of the state being able to change its mind in a future year and spend that money on tobacco control, the money was gone. That about, about 20 states securitized their payments. That's a major problem, that needs to be addressed. Another really important aspect that I think was not paid attention to was the role of Indian tribes. Uh, one of the reasons the states uh, have suffered tremendous losses uh, in, uh, in payments is because they're really unable, either legally unable or politically unwilling, to enforce their laws against Indian tribes. And if Indian tribes are not given an incentive by being beneficiaries from enforcement of the agreements instead of being able to benefit by not being subject to state law and being able to convince uh, state enforcement personnel to enforce uh, the, the, the laws on the Indian reservations. Uh, if they don't have a, if the tribes don't have a stake in the success of the agreement, then that uh, is an enormous loophole, as the states have found uh, very much to their detriment. Uh, uh, I think in future settlements, states should avoid arrangements that create incentives to protect the market share of settling defendants. I think that's one of the, uh, one of the real lessons from the master settlement agreement. And finally, uh, one of the things that's happened with the, the, the unfortunate formulas for compensation that uh, are established by the Master Settlement Agreement uh, is the way they've divided the states. Some of the states feel uh, it's in their interest uh, to, uh, uh, to hang tough. Other states want to compromise with the companies if the states don't have a continuing incentive to stand together, it's gonna to be very difficult to do anything successfully. Uh, and perhaps the most important thing uh, uh, that can be done uh, is to ensure that if there is a settlement and all the states are parties, that to the greatest extent possible, the states continue to have a common interest in pursuing socially constructive policies. Terrific presentations. Um, we've got 10 minutes now to uh, ask questions of the panel. Uh, so uh, please uh, uh, jump in if you have questions. I guess I have a question, um, get things started. Um, Folks who are not that acquainted with the settlement may be surprised uh, to realize that it doesn't address individual claims in any way. Um, how, what's that world look like right now in terms of uh, folks uh, finding uh, a way to be compensated for, uh, uh, for, for their health problems uh, due to cigarettes? Prior to the state litigation, no one had ever succeeded in holding the tobacco companies responsible for the damage that they caused. Uh, by virtue of the tremendous treasure trove of documents that came out, the proof of the industry misconduct, um, which all happened because of the state litigation and would not have happened without it, uh, there had, People do succeed. It's still difficult. The companies still use scorched earth 
defenses, it's not easy, but now people do win these lawsuits and uh, the, even, uh, even class actions uh, have been successful. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add I, it, to that. I think that, and I'm thinking ahead to some of the other challenges that other panels may wish to address, that that's a, a very important component that I, yeah, I didn't highlight, but Joelle and Mark did, uh, thinking, for instance, of the opioid challenge, um, that, that whatever happens in that um, uh, arena, one of the things that I think everyone would want is for the truth to come out, uh, what the pharmaceutical industry and companies knew at the time, uh, the science behind the product, uh, and to the extent that there are any institutions analogous to the Tobacco Institute or some of these institutions that put out false information deliberately, uh, that those be disbanded and eliminated. Joelle? Can I add one thing? Um, there have been a couple of, of success stories with individual litigation. There's a case, Evans v. Lorillard, um, out of Massachusetts. If you're interested, that one specifically gets at the targeting of the black community with menthol products it's and targeting of children. It's really a compelling story. Um, but one other thing I want to mention is that even though it's a limitation of the MSA um, that it doesn't compensate individuals harmed, um, they could, there are things that they, the states could do better than what they're doing. So for example, um, funding better cessation support services, that's a part of what Mark's talking about with the sort of underfunding of tobacco education and prevention programs. But that would be an element of those programs that the states could use their MSA dollars to fund at better that would support those very folks who are addicted and harmed and would like to quit. As we know, most adult users um, would like to stop using tobacco products. So that's sort of a missed opportunity in a lot of states. Please. Um, so I've got a, a question about how you would actually enforce that through an agreement like this, um, the, the state spending aspect of it, because that is something that we've kind of struggled with, whether or not that is simply kind of a structural limitation of the states actually settling these cases. There are you know, plenty of state case law that says legislatures cannot be uh, impeded, future legislatures cannot be impeded in their, in their appropriations powers, and that's something that we've run up against in New Jersey time and time again, and indeed our office is frequently called in to make those arguments. Um, and so there seems to be, to me, kind of three potential ways that you do it. Two of which, one, first is to put it in a court order. Um, and so rather than having the states try and meld something outside extrajudicial, that you actually have this done under the aegis of the court so that it then gets entered as some kind of consent order. And then you take that back to the legislature and you say, no, 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 you can't touch this money. Or it, it's dedicated somehow. Um, the other way is, I think we saw kind of with the, with the Volkswagen matter, where you actually had the, the feds condition receipt of the money, very cleverly, very thoughtfully condition receipt of the money on the state spending it for particular purposes, and that ties our hands in ways that, you know, interestingly, many folks in state government really appreciate, um, legislatures less so. Um, but of course, then you, that involves the federal government actually being involved in these, uh, in these kinds of settlements. And then the third thing, is individual state constitutional dedications. And in New Jersey, we've just had a kind of a big fight over this and, the, and uh, yeah, had, to, had to go through a referendum, went to the voters, that certain types of our environmental settlements now are constitutionally dedicated for certain purposes. But obviously that is not, that does, just does not seem to be practical at all um, in, in something like this tobacco to have every one of the states try and go and, and tie their hands in those ways. So, to me, it seems like the only feasible alternative there is some kind of a court order, but I'm curious to know if, if other people have figured a different way out. I'd like to address um, just one aspect of that. I think the three um, options that you mentioned are good ones. Um, I will mention a failure of um, that, that that came up in at least two states in the tobacco context where um, short of a constitutional amendment, I think that, that may work but there were at least two states that set up trusts uh, where the money was, a portion of the tobacco funds were dedicated to a trust. Um, it was you know, essentially a nonprofit type institution dedicated to tobacco control. Uh, and um, in theory, that may have put it beyond the scope of the legislature, but of course what happened is some years down the line, most recently in North Dakota, uh, this happened, the uh, legislature decided, well, we're, we're in a pinch. Um, there's, this trust has done a good job of keeping its corpus 
uh, you know, um, so that it can live off of that money for forevermore. Uh, well, we'd like that money, uh, and they have defunded these institutions. So I'm, uh, I'm not. I suppose I'm answering your question by saying what not to do, or or a cautionary tale uh, of what people have tried that did not work. Well, that they've not uniformly been unsuccessful. We saw the. Um, uh, an attempt uh, uh, to do that uh, uh, be unsuccessful in, in Mississippi, but uh, Oklahoma has successfully uh, preserved uh, a portion of uh, uh, tobacco settlement money uh, uh, in, uh, in a trust. Uh, that's continued uh, to go forward, so maybe looking uh, at the details of how that was done successfully uh, in that state may be instructive. But beyond that, uh, Payments don't have to go direct to the states. Uh, you could set up a foundation uh, to receive them. You could channel a portion of the recovery, uh, which would be appropriate in the uh, tobacco context, uh, to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, I think there are a lot of imaginative approaches that, uh, that could be used other than simply getting the money in and turning it over to the legislature to do whatever they want with. There's actually one other example, and I think this is a good lesson learned, um, is Minnesota. So Minnesota was one of the states that did a separate um, settlement, as you'll recall, and um, they used the commits the legislature to set aside the first couple of payments for the Clearway, which is a foundation that does a lot of tobacco education and prevention work in Minnesota. It's a life-limited organization, so it is not long for this world. It only has a few more years. But what, one of the things that was sort of key there, and I think that's challenging in litigation, is staying connected with the advocates on the ground. So there's still the political pressure and the sort of work with the legislature is happening at the same time as the negotiation of the settlement, which is, can easily be disconnected because the ad advocates don't have a role to play in litigation, as you well know, and aren't in the room during settlements. And often the litigators who are, are not coming from the issue area, um, but rather are just um, skilled litigators. And so I think that in Minnesota, one of the things that was successful, and probably in the other states where they were able to set aside chunks of money for their foundations um, in an ongoing matter, was that they, were, they stayed in close communication. They tried to identify what the um, public health expert priorities would be, and then um, keep up the political pressure at the same time. So not viewing them as totally separate processes, the policy and the litigation. Other questions? Christoph? Um, thank you very much for this very informative uh, panel on this topic. Um, question for uh, Michael about the marketing in, uh, restrictions that came out of the, the master settlement agreement. How, how did, um, what was the process for developing those? Um, they seem very specific and targeted um, and, you know, pretty wide ranging. Um, maybe not completely foresighted in, ter in terms of what may happen in the future, um, but certainly that's more imaginative than um, I would have expected. Um, and so I'm curious about that process and who, who, who provided input on that. Well, I, I don't know that I can answer your question completely because um, at the time I was, I was not at the table uh, for those, but I can, I can, uh, I think that what Mark said earlier um, in looking at this as a, a, a public health crisis and addressing the cultural shift. Um, uh, you know, there was an effort to get, tobacco had become ubiquitous. If I, I don't have the slide here, but if you see it, you know, we peaked in the 60s after the war, after sending, you know, cigarettes and sea rations to soldiers in World War II, et cetera. It, 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 the, and, you know, putting it in every movie, uh, every advertisement, every magazine, making them, you know, sexy, rebellious, uh, you know, the, the, they were everywhere, ubiquitous. Um, so in, in my opinion, a lot of them, a lot of the public health restrictions are designed to counter uh, that uh, decades-long effort of the tobacco companies to insert them into every aspect of our culture. You know, getting them off, they, they were already off TV, so to speak, but they, they really weren't. So getting them out of the billboards, you know, the Times Square, if you walked up, up to 
Times Square back then, you would have just seen tobacco billboards all over, uh, getting them out of the movies, uh, um, getting them um, uh, off of uh, the, the sports sponsorship, et cetera. And I'd note uh, uh, one thing about this is, you know, the, we haven't talked about the FDA. The FDA came about after the tobacco companies, at least in its current um, iteration. And um, one thing about the MSA uh, in comparison to the FDA, the FDA also has restrictions, but our agreement actually goes beyond what the FDA has done or ever could do because certain aspects of the restrictions in our agreement would, would have been found by the Supreme Court um, essentially to be um, business protected uh, speech. Uh, First Amendment business protected speech. Um, and they com the companies can give that speech up by contract, um, but they, the federal government could not take it away. Um, so a, a very important um, aspect of our settlement. Arguably, um, we, arguably whoever negotiated what their thought was, we, we shot a little short of it or we didn't have the foresight to anticipate the scope of the internet um, you know, back in the early 90s. Uh, social media. Shame on um, you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and 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 you know, and and we're struggling with that now, yeah. and and it's becoming, you know, what what you know, back then the forms of media, magazine, television, movies, we're struggling with a new a new range of it yeah. today. So. Final it, comments, Mark. Yeah. Uh, in answer to your uh, your question, uh, the negotiators were in touch with the public health community, and they were getting input uh, from uh, people who were doing research into these areas, so they, they very much uh, knew what they were doing. They wanted to do more. They wanted to have uh, restrictions, uh, for example, at the point of sale, which they were unable to get. So this is a negotiated process. It's a settlement, after all. But uh, the public health advocates weren't at the table, but they were informing uh, what the states did. Well, let's thank our terrific uh, panel.